Gracias por estar acá. I'll speak English because he speaks English. <laughs> uh, in fact, I speak English because I don't know any German. <laughs> so, he can speak German, so we all just have a word, but I hope we will start better in English than German. He, he's Christian Fox? 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 It's the same thing. Okay. And he comes from Europe. He has been around a lot of universities. He has been moving from from Germany to now to the Netherlands, and he will present himself a little bit so that you know where he has been working. He's a security, computer dependability expert, <laughs> I hope. Oh, my experts. <laughs> and, and, but uh, I hope you will find his content very interesting. Thank you. So, hi. Uh, thanks for the, introduction, for the introduction. So, I originally started out uh, with my degree just after high school, dropping out, and uh, eventually did, well, I worked as a networks administrator and focused on network security. I did that for around 10 years and eventually found out, hey, a degree would be nice. So I did evening school, went through hell, uh, did my bachelor's in Austria, where I come from, so I'm actually Austrian. And so not, not the thing with kangaroos, but the uh, country with mountains next to Italy. Uh, eventually, well, I started working in malware research with Europa, in also Austria, well, Europe in this case, and uh, there, well, I then moved for doing a master's in Germany because well, I had a job there, and eventually I found out that there was a space program at my home university in Munich, so I started working with them, and what I'll present to you is essentially part of my research from the past two and a half years. I started doing that with just a study project, uh, eventually worked as a student assistant, then got hired staff, uh, also did my master's on that, and, so, and for the past year I essentially tingled around in the world to present my research. So, um, please be here with me. Uh, guys, if, if I'm talking a bit too fast, please just tell me. And if you have questions, I would appreciate it if you could ask them when you get when you, when you have a question, just raise your hand or whatever, just shout and tell me that you have a question, that you're something is not clear, unclear or something. So when we think about dependability, people usually think about you know uh, structural dependent dependability, that something is not supposed to collapse, which unfortunately sometimes happens. So, uh, structural collapses happen more than often, but we also have that in IT. So, for example, for a dam, if a dam is breached due to control failure, that's not so nice. And uh, unfortunately, usually companies that design those dams or whatever it is now, uh, they often don't really take much care of that. And there is a lot of research that needs to be done in this area. Part of that, sometimes results in very interesting things, like in this case, that's, that's in Taiwan, and uh, the gas company, who this gas pipeline here belonged to, uh, unfortunately had a failure in their, in their monitoring system, and they didn't see that the pressure was dropping, and well, uh, things went a bit out of hand. So, sometimes IT failures can go really bad, and, well, for example, in this case, this is Fukushima, uh, there again it was essentially a sensor problem. In the end it was a combination of, well, a bad, really bad disaster out here uh, with a couple of human errors and a computer display problem. So in this case it was just a sensor being misinterpreted and misread by software. And in the end you get a nuclear disaster. And plus a couple of other industries also crashing and burning next to that. So, me personally, I'm doing research, of course, on space stuff. Not rockets, but with rockets you can do a lot of bad things. And if you launch a rocket, you don't want your rocket to go astray or do weird things. If you send a satellite to space, you want it to actually arrive there. And you want to operate the satellite for many years in space. Now, what happens if that doesn't work? For example, this yeah. Yeah. This was the launch of the first Ariane 5 rocket. And it's, you know, just oh, no. nice. Eventually it launches. Oh, no. But 
unfortunately, some of the flaws sometimes are really bad. Especially intentional flaws. Intentional flaws can ruin your day. Because sometimes an integer workflow represents the orientation of your object. And suddenly your own computer might think, oh, um, maybe the rocket is 90 degrees off course. And this is what happened in this case. First I ran it. That's a pure software fault. And this is not even something that where we are talking about hardware being defective or a processor being anything like this. This is just a software fault. But we still have to design software and hardware to cope with issues like that. If we don't do that, we get a very expensive firework, like in this case. You don't want to do that, and you don't want to be this guy here, who was the launch responsible. So, going back to the presentation, what I'm doing is satellites. And when I, when I talk about satellites, this is essentially what you think about. Hubble, big satellites, highly high prestige projects, many billion dollars involved, lots of high, high prestige hardware, many manufacturers, many companies, many uh, many nation states involved in that, all working together, somehow harmoniously or not. Um, but a satellite like that, unless it's really something really big as Hubble, until a couple of years ago we could maintain that in orbit. But even for regular commercial satellites, that was not an option. You can't just go to space nowadays and fix a satellite. That doesn't work. You have to be able to maintain a satellite fully, remotely over a very narrow band. So here we're talking about modem speeds. So very low speeds. So to cope with that, people well, actually become very conservative. In space engineering, people stick to something called technology readiness levels, or TRLs, those things here. It's just different levels of maturity. So if you use a very untested system, so where you just established a basic principle and you just code it and that's it, um, then you have a very low TRL, so very low reliability level, of course. If you, on the other hand, have something with a very high reliability, you have to test it properly, you have to verify it properly. And if you want to go to the highest level, TRL 9 up here, then you actually have to have your system go to space. Not just in a demo setup, but you actually have to launch a satellite or any other spacecraft with exactly that onboard computer, or exactly that processor, that chip, whatever it is, that memory. And when, talk, when, when building a satellite, sometimes satellite design takes decades. So we're not talking about a year or two build time. No, we're talking about 15, 20 years of build time. That's not uncommon, especially for high prestige missions. What does that mean? Well, actually, if you want a tier L9 system on your satellite, it means that it will be 30 years old, something like that, 20 to 30 years. Well, if we nowadays used hardware from 20 years ago, what would they give us? Well, maybe a 486 processor currently, I guess. Good question. Does that mean that what you're doing now will be used in 50 years? Or yes. <laughs> yes, well, in the regular space industry, yes. That's, that's part of the issue. Because what people did 20 years ago is still being used nowadays. So a long time ago, um, in the early times of eBay, eBay released propaganda that NASA was buying processors of eBay to restock the space ship. That was not an urban legend, that was reality, that was the truth. NASA actually really went on eBay and bought 1886 processors, used ones from your desktop PC, to be equipped or actually retrofit, upgrade the space ship because they had run out of those chips until they didn't produce them anymore. So they had to buy used ones. And that's an issue. And that's what my research is also focused on, to get away from that. To no longer have to deal with ancient hardware, but to show people, hey, you can actually do it differently. You don't have to rely on this scale here, that this is not God. You, you, can, you can do something different. And which brings us to why people stick to those TRLs so much. Well, first of all, if you send something to space, you have to live with a power budget. So imagine a satellite, or imagine ISS, it has huge solar panels. Every satellite you think of has solar panels. Um, if you have a big state-sponsored craft, military things, 
they sometimes come with little reactors, something like a nuclear stuff. Um, even though that's nowadays no longer so much in use, it's still a viable option up there. But designing hardware for well, that's supposed to run next to a nuclear reactor is uh, kind of, it's a challenge. You also have to fit in your spacecraft. You have to also fit in, for example, a missile like this. You have to be launched. You have to survive launch. So that's tough because we can't just, you know, use a desktop PC like that. It wouldn't survive a couple of thousand Gs of launch. Um, well, next, once we are up in space, we are left with a couple of hundred kilobits up and down here, tops. If we just do commandeering, so just you know, remote controlling a satellite, um, people often use UHF and VHF bands. That's radio. So general radio like the, the one that wakes you up in the morning. Um, bandwidth is just the air are really low, as in maybe 19,600 pounds. So uh, you know, making telephone things. Um, eventually you are then in orbit, hopefully if you survive the launch, and you have to live there. You cannot go there and plug a cable in there and update the operating system. You have to be able to do that remotely, fully remotely. There is no reset button pressing possible. It doesn't work. You cannot do that. You have to do all of that remotely. And unfortunately, this IT industry out there, well, they're not really focused on that. Nobody is developing those systems besides, you know, people like us working on highly critical systems. No matter if it's space or if it's, um, I don't know, power plants, if it's any other really, really, really critical infrastructure. But in the end, it's, it's all the same requirements there. So in particular in space, we have to live with a couple of additional uh, interesting challenges. First of all, we have extreme temperature shifts. So if we're on the sunny side, then we might heat up to 100 or 200 degrees Celsius. Everything I tell is Celsius and you know, international rotation. Um, heat dissipation, well, you can be irradiated. So infrared radiation is what gets heat off your back. But there is no convection. There is no air. A heat sink with a nice fan on top will not cool your device in space. There is no air to do that. So unless you pressurize your satellite, which you cannot because it's too expensive, um, you will have an issue. Finally, uh, there is radiation. And that radiation either you bring by yourself, or if you don't bring it yourself, it's still there. Because up in space, there is a lot of radiation. And you have to deal with that. You have to deal with that simply because, well, eventually if your satellite is in orbit, it will eventually pass through these belts. But there are also other sources for radiation that we can't just turn off, like uh, uh, so, uh, solar particle events coming from the sun. Well, we can't do anything about that. Or uh, cosmic rays. There is no way we can turn off a different galaxy. So we have to live with that. We have to design our software and hardware to cope with these hazards. Uh, here is a slightly different view on that to give you a better idea that well, actually, eventually, you have to pass through those red areas here, which just symbolize uh, stronger radiation. Um, based on your Earth, um, you can actually see also a couple of disturbances in here, for example. This, that's called the South Atlantic Anomaly. Um, also, on the North and South Pole, this is actually the area, well, I'll briefly go back here. This is this area here. That, that's where the magnetic field goes back through the surface of the Earth. Well, something like that. Uh, eventually, your satellite will pass through there. And what that means is, well, for example, for memory, it gets your bit flips. Uh, any kind of register, for example, in a processor, if there is a, a particle event, or it's, or as, as we call it, an event set, within a register or within a memory cell, uh, well, you will probably turn a zero into a one or, or, or one into a zero might overload certain components within your, within your spacecraft, within your computer. Now, on the Earth, we rarely have those issues. So no one really deals with that on the Earth, unless you're building nuclear power plants and stuff like that, which again means that you don't really have so much financial pressure. In space, on the other hand, 
well, you're spending billions and billions and billions of dollars, euros, whatever it is, to just get your satellite built and into space. So spending a couple of thousand more of whatever currency um, doesn't hurt so much. Unfortunately, if you don't have such a vast budget, uh, well, you can't really buy those devices. And they're also often export restricted. So for example, US hardware is usually very hard to come by because the US has export restrictions on radiation hard hardware. Radiation hard hardware in this case means, well, it's also hardware that could be used for proliferation, for building rockets by evil people. Uh, so they don't export it. So for example, in Europe, we can't really get that hardware, so we have to develop it ourselves. France has a similar restriction, for example. So the US is not at all there. Russia as well. So, still, what you can do with, or to get radiation hard hardware in general, uh, first of all, you can use specialized manufacturing techniques. It just means you use um, special carrier material, you use uh, specialized etching, you grow crystals in a certain way so that they absorb certain electrical effects that would be induced by radiation to avoid bit flips, to avoid. Uh, interferences or crosstalk or anything like that that happens due to radiation. Uh, you can also bring shielding, but unless you have a very big satellite, it doesn't really make sense to dedicate a lot of your payload size or payload weight to shielding. I mean, sure, you can bring depleted boron, but unless you are nuclear power, you will probably not have that so much. Especially not if you're a university and you want to build a satellite on your own. I mean, you don't have so much money anyway, so how about not spending that on depleted boron or on taking water to orbit, which, by the way, costs you around, the last statistic I got was around 20,000 US dollars per kilogram. That's a lot of money. And that's only, that only applies if you buy in bulk, so if you're or if you're a space agency or a big company bringing many satellites into space. Finally, you can do stuff on the architecture and logic level, which is essentially what we in computer science usually do, but um, unfortunately, much of that research that we have been doing in the past 30, 40 years has not found its way yet into space engineering. Why? No reason. So, actually, there's a lot to do now, and a lot of research that can be done in this field. That's also what I've been doing. And you can do also a lot in software. Usually, people throw around with two words there, and that one is EDAC, error detection and correction. Very simple, everyone uses that already. If your server, for example, has ECC memory, this ECC memory does error correction and detection. It's just the major coding in the end. Fault detection, isolation, and recovery is another magic word for space engineering, which is really just that fault detection, but then you react to a detected fault and solve that. Um, again, it's very simple actually, and that's what we do in networking, in IT security, in everywhere. We do that every day. We just have to apply it to space as well. And we have to, well, in the end, care and feed space engineers sometimes to tell them, hey, how about doing it this way? And that's what I'm going to be doing in the next couple of minutes. Too. So, when we talk about, well, unfortunately, we can't read this up here very well, um, compute dependency. How can we achieve compute dependency? So, first of all, we can get legacy technology. We can go to eBay and buy old processes. That's not really easy. Uh, we can use core structures, which essentially defaults to legacy hardware. Um, we can do DMR, TMR, lots of magic words. And those magic words I'll explain in a bit. And there is a lot of ongoing research, which mainly is driven by IT, so by us. So, dual model redundancy is the first magic keyword here. It just means that you have some input and you drive two independent systems with that and you have some magic oracle or supervisor that decides which of the two is right. Often you also assume that one side is always right and the other one just so is supposed to confirm it. And if both, both of them disagree, you don't do something or you just do a report. Um, for example, in many industrial applications, uh, the supervisor is also human. So, for example, someone sitting in front of a SCADA interface uh, controlling a dam, power plant, something like that. Now, if you actually want compute integrity, 
uh, well, you have to go for voting because that's the only thing you can do. So you take well, an odd number of devices, three, five, something like that, and let them all compute based on the same input. And then you just vote. And eventually, yes? Okay. And eventually you can then decide which of the, which two of them, so if we're doing a majority vote, of course, which two of them are right. Unfortunately, that by itself is not sufficient to uh, give you real computer integrity because, you know, if you have nice input here and that sensor fails, then all three of your processes will just compute something wrong. So you actually want to TMR, so you want to trivialize all of the input as well. And as you can see from this figure here already, things can get, get very complicated just very quickly, just by doing very simple things at this level. And you can do this in electro at the electronics level, you can do this at the component level, you can do this at the system level as well. And things can become very fragile then, even though your system was originally designed to be very resilient. Now, for example, how this can look like in a very old, very simple system. That's a Saturn V. So, you know, Apollo, moon missions. Here's memory. And here would be some EDAC logic, duplicated of course, and here you would have some registers and, and some comparison logic. And even though this is just really memory being connected to a processor down here, um, you already have a lot of different blocks here. This is just a logical level. This is not electrical, of course. Um, as soon as you add a bit more, uh, things get really complicated and really vulnerable as well. Um, I, I, just, just a couple of months ago, I attended a conference and a major industrial company said, oh, okay, uh, we provide a highly reliable data storage device for you. And it's about this size and it's 15 kilos heavy and it can store two terabytes, of, uh, two terabit of data. That's, first of all, not very much data to be stored. It's very heavy and it has millions of solar points. How do you test that? The simple answer is you don't. You just assume it works and hope it works. And if it doesn't, then well, it's warranty. But in space, we don't really, well, we don't really have warranty because, well, if you satellite in space, what warranty do you want to provide? Do you want to send the technicians to space? That's not possible. Really. So if you apply this to a processor, if you want to do um, voting in the processor, within the processor, not externally, uh, things can become even more complicated. You don't have to understand this figure here. Just take with you that things can become very difficult here. And testing that is even more hard. It's essentially non debuggable So that brings us to actual processes that truly exist. So not just the concepts of how to do it. First of all, the today's, well, let's say, standard process in space. That's the Leon family here. Uh, it's a Spark very neat design, it's ultra Spark. Uh, the old Sun servers had that for that, for example. It's, it's actually open source, well, to a certain degree, but you can use the non redundant or non reliable version for free, so that's GPL. And if you throw in money, you can get a fault tolerant edition, which then does true model redundancy everywhere and does erasure coding for caches, registers, all of that. And that's being used in about most modern day space projects. However, the processor design, so the Leo processor design, is from around 2002. And Spark version 8, that was actually developed much longer ago. So Spark version 8 was current, I think, in 1989 or 1990, something like that. Um, another major process is the RAT6000. And it's based on well, this nice processor here, and as you can guess from RISC single, single chip, that's really old as well. That's the seven, late 70s. Um, a bit newer, of use for number crunching is PowerPCs. So PowerPC 750, to give you a general idea of what time we're talking here about, that's roughly, well, actually PowerPC 750 was introduced in, um, in a PowerMac G3. That's the blue Apple servers, uh, Apple desktops back then, from I think 2005. But they are being used for number crunching in space. People have told me the word number crunching in this context. 
then there is, of course, all kinds of custom architectures, like uh, the MILF standard stuff, um, which is being programmed in custom programming languages that we don't know, that you only will know if you work with one of those processes. You will only have access to the development environment if you own a license for this stuff. So there's no way you can do open development on that, especially as a university, that's not the way to go. And in the end, space relies on custom ethics. Why custom ethics? Well, they're expensive, sure, but the space industry doesn't really care about that. For them, it's important to have the capability to do custom ethics. Because the space industry until the 1970s was used to having well, essentially their own IT industry. They maintained their own IT industry for a long, long time until they couldn't do that anymore. And then NASA let go of all their people working on that. That's why nowadays we are in space engineering at the level that's essentially before the Voyager probes. In the Voyager probes there is a lot in there that nowadays we do not know anymore. Or that's not widely known in engineering anymore. In the IT industry we have a lot of that. But it's just not prominent there. Okay. Now there are some things that simply break those concepts, that break those triple model redundancy approaches with nice red hot processes. And that's as soon as you go away from static single core architectures. Sure, the space industry has adopted multi-core processes. But in the end, as soon as you do branch prediction, as you do uh, multiple levels of caching, the space industry tries to stay away from caches because they add non-determinism. Because then it's no longer obvious well, what will happen next in the next tick. Branch prediction is, is a demo. It's, it's dangerous for them and they don't want to use it. That's the same thing with many other, well, for us, mobile processor features. Um, and then there's, of course, killer features like virtualization, for example. As soon as you move away from a physical processor setup towards a more logical view on things, as soon as you abstract to a level where you don't have one um, operating system running on one processor anymore, or one processor core, uh, those systems cannot deal, handle, with, handle that. They cannot deal with those approaches. They cannot deal with virtualization. They don't know that now in one virtual machine there is something going on. Now maybe, I don't know, maybe hypervisor just switched in, rescheduled a different virtual machine. Uh, those approaches do not apply here. Um, there are some things that you could do higher with, uh, with virtualization. You could, for example, use virtualization to actually do voting, to get away from having triple model redundancy in hardware. You could do that in software as well. You could do that with virtual machines. You could vote on the program flow of virtual machines. It is possible. People haven't done it yet. That's actually a nice hint for you guys if someone wants to research on this. Okay, back to Hubble. So, that actually, I guess, explains a bit why space hardware is very expensive and why development there takes a long, long time. If your hardware is ultra expensive, it's very difficult to justify to a commercially operating organization that they are supposed to do something new now, that they are supposed to change something in the running system. So, if you want to go to something new there, like in this case, the James Webb Space Telescope, that can have, well, slightly problematic results. So here, the red line, that's the expected, expected costs of the launch. So back then, when they started working on James Webb, they expected to, have a budget, to use a budget of 500 million US dollars. And nowadays, we are at 8.5 billion. Um, project management like that is unfortunately very complicated due to a majority of reasons. Also because James Webb is a multinational project nation states involved, lots of different interests. However, uh, James Webb being delayed or being built for, what was it, 24 years now, that's not very uncommon. So these are for comparison a couple of other similar missions from the past. And well, the quickest one was the XMM Newton, which was only built by NASA. So no other nation state. I think, I think only built by NASA. Some instruments came from Max Planck, I think, but that's it. Um, so there, there is a lot of well, delay in there, and if you want to use uh, TRL-9 hardware from James Webb, it means that you will be using 24-year-old hardware if you start building your satellite now. 
It means that in 10 years you will probably be launching that satellite, which gives you 34 year old hardware at TRL 9. But it's very reliable, but no longer available. So that's why people started thinking about how to do things differently. And the only way they thought they could go on was actually to miniaturize, to do the same thing that we did in the IT industry about 50, 60, 70 years ago. We went away from mainframes. We don't want eight mainframes in the world built by IBM. We want our desktop PCs, our laptops, all of that. But the only way was to miniaturize, simplify it as well. So the first thing that people did was microsatellites. Microsatellites are just smaller, lighter. You know, it gives you something between 10 and 100 kilograms, often the size of a washing machine to give you a general idea. So that's much easier to build. It doesn't take you 10, 15, 20 years, but maybe only five years. But it's still very expensive and you need specialized personnel, you still need industrial partners to build those devices and you need specialized hardware. In the end you'll still spend maybe 10 to 100 million US dollars on one of those projects, plus launch of course. So for universities that's not really a way to go. If you want to do science, if you want to do research, sometimes launching within, well let's say a PhD period might be a good idea because you want your PhD students with a detector that needs to go to space and you don't want to wait 50 years for that to happen. To do that, well, people actually came up with nano and paper satellites. Much smaller, much easier to build and by now I think we've launched about, what was it, 300, 400 in the past 10 years. Um, currently there are plans for 2020 to have by 2020 around uh, 2,000 nanosatellites launched. 2,000 satellites in this case means that we will double the amount of satellites that have been launched by humankind within the next five years. That's actually pretty impressive and all you need for that is something like 200,000 US dollars of budget for your university. If you give a motivated student 200,000 US dollars, you can go to space. You can build one of those satellites here. This picture is actually taken um, or was taken by a company called Planet Labs. Their startup, they got a couple of million US dollars uh, startup money and they want to provide a service which is essentially Google Maps in real time and you can buy a map material or real time observation material for any point on the earth that you are allowed to see of course and it will be real time will be accurate up to I think 10 centimeters or something so if you want to buy an island or something that's the way to go so that company has actually by now launched around 30 or 40 nanosatellites within just two years and those nanosatellites are incredibly cheap for them cost them currently around 50,000 US dollars to build and launch one of those to give you an idea of how big they are the product is long small but you can do science with that and you can even commercialize an enterprise with that. So, fun thing is you can build that as a student. Why? Well, because it's not so difficult. It's pretty much the level of IT skills you need to build a desktop computer or maybe to you know, work with an Arduino or, or a Raspberry or something like that. It's, it's similar hardware. So, if you build such hardware, you can act as long as you fit into a so-called deployer, that's the blue box here, um, you can really reduce your launch costs. Why? Well, because this is a standard. It's a standardized deployer, has a spring back here, just a metal spring, has an electric latch here, and as long as you fit in there, well, you can launch for cheap. You can launch for, let's say, 80,000 US dollars for a single unit CubeSat, 70,000, or if you're in the US, you can launch for free. Okay, that was actually our first demo satellite you saw in the previous picture. So, this one, that was the first move. It was built by colleagues of mine, and at the very end of the project, I was still involved into it, uh, looking at a very interesting implementation of an operating system. And well, here you can just get a very basic idea of what hardware was in there. Remember that this satellite, they started building it in 2006. So back then, that was pretty much embedded hardware state of the art. That's essentially an ARM9 processor. Nowadays, 
an equivalent would be a Cortex E5. So it's actually a nice hardware. So it costs us in total, including manpower costs for I think two PhD students, costs us 200 US dollar, 200,000 US dollar to build it and launch it. Unfortunately, it took a bit longer because we didn't have, have so much manpower. So that's how you can think about one of those satellites. It's essentially a stack of PCBs. Simple, but it works. Has a battery here, plus a heating system, of course, because uh, we usually use lithium ion batteries in space. And if you cool down a lithium ion battery below zero degrees, um, those batteries usually tend to no longer function so well or blow up and something like that. We don't want that, so we have to, uh, we have to do a lot of engineering on top to maintain a proper uh, thermal layout for the entire satellite. And for the rest, well, it's mostly really very simple hardware. The design for the Omer computer for the satellite was actually based on an Atmel evaluation board. Sure, there were lots of obstacles in the way, but it worked out in the end. And you can build one of those satellites yourself. You need to integrate it, of course, you add a bit of structure, you add, you add reflective foil to keep your thermal management low, um, you add a couple of PCBs, and of course solar cells, because you want to maintain well, power. <laughs> so eventually you will then be sent, like us in this case, to Yasni, that's a Russian missile base in Siberia. It's a bit north of Kazakhstan. Um, where you then get put into a nice CubeSat deployer. This is a you know, bigger image of the deployer from before. Just this one houses more CubeSats. Uh, here you can actually see the spring a bit better than before. And, well, here's the first one. Um, and then eventually you don't want to launch alone. You don't want to also launch just one CubeSat deployer, but you get launched in a big launch group. Maybe 10, 15, 20 satellites. And that's also what makes launches so affordable. Comparably affordable, of course, um, because that actually means that on an average set, um, rocket launch, you launch one main payload, which is up here, which in this case was two by sub two, um, an Earth observation satellite from Dubai. Um, here we have one, two, three, four micro satellites, so the 110 to 100 kilo ones I talked about before, and then there's a couple of tubes that deploy us around here. We were down here, and eventually you get them loaded and shipped off into well, a very secretive environment because that's a nuclear missile base, and eventually you launch. Eventually you then get deployed up in space, and because that, or well, the rocket we launched with was an old Russian ICBM, uh, you eventually well, you have to turn around a little bit, and usually here there would be nuclear bombs dropping out in the world. Uh, thankfully, those rockets are nowadays being used for civilian purposes and for research, which is really nice, actually. Um, so this is an actual deployment. So what you can see here is, um, here up here is the Westat, I guess. Um, here's the upper stage that was uh, removed from here, that one, that's the upper stage. Um, and then all the little CubeSats get deployed just like on, on a string. Little pearls, little string of pearls. And eventually, well, of course, you have to wait to get a hunt of the CubeSat. And that's our antenna up in Munich on the roof of our building. And well, that's how first move looked like when it was freshly assembled. And eventually, we finally also got data. Now, first move unfortunately died after two months of operation, but we learned a lot about that. And we are currently developing. The success of keeps up based on that. And ever since we started coming up with the idea of Move 2, I've been involved in the project, so that's for the past two and a half years, three years, three years by now. Um, in the end, it's, it's a logical progression of first move. First of all, we, we are using modern day hardware. And in between first move and move two, there was the entire well, smartphone evolution. Nowadays, your smartphone has about 10 times as much performance than an average satellite. We can use that, for example, to run a regular operating system, a standard operating system like Linux. We can run that on the CubeSat. It's perfectly sufficient. Uh, we can provide regular interfaces that we do from the Earth. We can connect all the normal sensors. We can 
buy of mouse or whatever component store you're using. Um, we can use, you know, just SD RAM, stuff like that, everything we can buy in the earth, we can use that. We don't have to use red hot hardware. Okay, unfortunately that leaves you with one issue, and that is that you either go for red hot hardware from the space industry, which we cannot afford, or you don't do anything currently. And that's where my research comes in, and that's what I've been doing for the past three years. Do we still have time for that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you want to do dependability in space with modern day hardware, with much more, well, let's say structurally reduced hardware, so much more highly integrated stuff, you can't just use true modern redundancy everywhere. You can't use specialized manufacturing anymore because it becomes very expensive. There is one exception, that's silicon and insulator, which will probably be used in the next couple of years in a lot of embedded hardware because it allows us to reduce structural width. Um, so what we have to do is actually look on the entire thing, on, on the system, more, more like in the computer side. Of you. We have to think about a processor as something that lives on the pyramid of memory. Well, every one of us knows that from some basic courses during bachelors or something. Just your memory pyramid, registers, caches, volatile memory, um, maybe then some flash here, eventually back then it was disks down here, stuff like that. But what we have to do then is we have to essentially take care of every single one of those logical blocks here and secure them and add integrity safeguards for every single one of them. And only if we can add sufficient safeguards for every single of those aspects, only then we can actually secure the system properly. And that's something that in the space industry is currently not really there. So there are some people doing research on that, but this has been beginning only in, let's say, about five years ago. There's a lot to be done. And, for example, this is what I did for storage integrity. So when we think about data storage on a satellite, we essentially have three different kinds of memory. We have system storage for your operating system or some firmware, stuff like that. We have payload data that's being stored there, so that's that's a lot more. Maybe data from a sensor, maybe uh, radio data that or TV that you want to cache temporarily, um, things like that. And eventually, of course, volatile memory, so system memory. Um, when data is being accessed um, on an operating system volume in a file system, for example, that's essentially what you have. What happens here? You have an application, an API. Well, you have to use that, provided by your kernel. Uh, you go through a file system, you do go through a lot of abstraction, through a device driver, and eventually you end up with some memory technology that you would then in the end drive. Um, for us, that's all normal. But in the space industry, that's just not so <laughs> widely known that that's behind this. And th this, this slide I actually designed for uh, a presentation for space engineers who did not know that. So I had to spend around five to ten minutes explaining how an application goes through an API, etc., etc., to finally access data on a volume. Now, people in space usually go for, yeah, okay, we use Red Hat hardware here at this level, at the very low level, and that's really good if you have unlimited money. You don't have unlimited money in academia. So what you could instead do is, well, we can add rate or something. But unfortunately, RAID, for example, doesn't guarantee integrity. It only prevents failure, or well, it only hides failure. But that's also not so nice. So what you can use, for example, is MRAM. MRAM is radiation tolerant, whereas most other uh, storage technologies are not. MRAM stores data as, as a resistance state. And a radiation event or a little uncharged particle coming in through here cannot change this, this state. So we don't have random bit flips anymore, which is really nice. But we still have to, if, in a certain way, defend from flaws and in, in control logic that's connected to here. Um, every memory has some kind of little controller like unit on the chip. And that controller can still, well, work non dependently at some point in time. So, what we actually have to do, or can think about when we use MRAM, is, well, first of all, we're using MRAM here, which is directly addressable memory. So we have a memory method. 
And we don't have a block abstraction. If it's, there isn't there are no blocks, we can do byte-wise access. Or if we buy proper memory with a, and use a proper controller, we could even do bit-wise access, which we usually don't do, but heck. Um, there is no device abstraction here because MRAM is usually mapped directly in, into, our, in, into our physical memory address space. So what we instead should do is work at the fastest number level. And it turns out there is actually a lot of problems with file systems here. Because um, unfortunately all the development in file systems over the past 20 years has gone into supporting bigger and bigger and bigger volumes. So if you want to connect a petabyte volume, you're really good. But unfortunately we don't have that. So we only have maybe 5 to 8 to 16 megabytes of, of system storage space. You cannot scale BTRFS or ZFS down to such a low level. It's technically impossible, unfortunately. Sure, we could fork BTRFS or X4 or whatever to support very low, very small volumes, but then we would be left with a very incorrectly specified file system for a completely different use case. That's an issue. So, um, what we actually can do with MRAM as well is, well, we can actually utilize memory protection. So, if you think about how memory is being mapped in a system, you know, well, you either do direct memory mapping on the bus or you use an IO review for that. So, you get your physical memory layout. And this again is for you know, space engineers who are not familiar with memory address translation and virtual memory. We can actually use virtual memory for protecting data on an, M uh, an MRAM chip because we can actually use memory protection. So we can just set non used areas of, of our MRAM chip or of our system volume as read only. So even if our processor or if, even if a program within our system go, goes all crazy, we can still prevent it from writing to that memory. And that's actually what I implemented then because there unfortunately were no alternatives for that use case. That's a uh, so-called FTRFS, fault tolerant, radiation robust file system. And it essentially compiles a region coding, um, memory protection, and very simple integrity, integrity checking into one very simple piece of file system. It's a very primitive file system that's only meant to store a very simple operating system with an MRAM, but it's sufficient for, let's say, 90% of the satellites that are out there. Sure, there are some satellites that need more, but they really actually don't want to store data on MRAM anymore, but you have to go for larger volumes, and there we only have flash. Currently, we only have flash. Do we still have time? Okay. How long will it take? Or less? A couple of minutes. Yes. Okay. So we're talking about flash. This, this actually goes now a bit into the electrical level. So gets more in deep than the rest of the talk. So when, when, when we think about flash memory, we usually are left with two big memory types. We are left with NAND flash and no flash. Uh, for now, for mass storage, we essentially can only think about NAND flash because no flash cannot be scaled so well. So we get a lot more storage space with NAND flash. So NAND flash can only be addressed in, in blocks. Well, actually in pages and in blocks, because there's two things there. So uh, pages we can read arbitrarily. We can read one page at a time from anywhere we want. Um, we cannot just go somewhere and read uh, one byte of data only from flash. We have to read an entire page. But that page we can read from anywhere. If we want to write, we first have to erase an entire block, which consists of many pages, and then this uh, and then this entire block we can update and write again. So it's, it's a more complicated approach, and unfortunately, there is wear in Flash. Most of you probably know what wear is in Flash. I'll still just quickly cover that. Essentially, over time, those little gates unfortunately die. Um, so over time we will have defective bits in there or defective blocks in there and we can compensate for that only with erasure coding. Of course erasure coding is a bit slower and for most of the IT industry we trade 
well, a spare area for, uh, for more performance, for not having performance degradation due to wear. Now, if we look at that more closely, that's actually how Flash works. Well, one of the two major uh, Flash technologies. The other one works almost the same way. So you have a floating gate, which is essentially charged with electrons. So you just add more. You have more electrons into it. And then you essentially get uh, voltage distribution. So you get one of those two hills here. And depending on if you go beyond the voltage threshold, so that's this line in here, um, then you can either interpret that charge as a zero or a one. Where is it go for now? For radiation tolerance stuff, what you want to do is add two safety margins here, so called reasons, the program verify. So what you do is essentially you just move those two uh, dash lines here outwards, and thereby you can uh, increase the survivability of your memory a lot. Unfortunately, single level cell flash, as this is called, is no longer really available in the open market. Nowadays, all the solid state drives, or all the NAND flash you can get of your favorite component vendor will probably be MLC flash, multi level cell flash. And what happens there is essentially just that we, oh, we add more logic, we add more functionality to one single cell. And we do that by just having better uh, sensing and, and charge deposit electronics, and we just add more thresholds. So we don't just have one threshold. Let's say we have three thresholds. Thereby we can represent two bits within one, one MLC flash cell. Now, looking at leakage, that's the blue part here, eventually leakage degenerates the charge. So we will have a bit flip over time. We will also have wear, so eventually that entire cell of two bits will die and or will just hang in some value. Not so nice and but for that we can correct, we can compensate with the region code, simply in here. Now there is another issue in space of course, which is again radiation. And radiation can give you, well, a different error band, because you don't just lose charge here. You don't just travel with this mountain down here to the left, but you actually can go anywhere. For just two level cell flash, that's not so correct. But if we add more thresholds, that this can become a lot more of an issue, that we can have multi-bit flips just with very primitive errors. So there we actually have to move away from simple, almost simple, only simplified equation coding that we were also using for uh, ECC memory for SD RAM, for example, or for EDR RAM. There we actually have to use much stronger equation coding. Again, that's something that I've been working on about uh, two years ago, and that's called MTD mirror. That was part of the master thesis back then, and I actually implemented that for the MTD um, flash handling layer in the Linux kernel. Uh, by the way, the file system that I presented to you earlier on, that was also for Linux. So you can use it, it's on the internet, it's open source. Okay, I won't go into detail on Solomon and, and the DPC. This is something that, well, we could, we could spend an entire lecture on just major coding. Uh, let's just say that you have to, due to the different characteristics of multi-level cell flash, you will have not just bit drop and single bit flips, but you will also have entire, um, let's say, sets of 6, 8, 16 bits dying at the same time. And your major coding has to deal with that. That's, for example, where Reed Solomon is really efficient for. Uh, on the other hand, LDPC, this is called Load Density Parity Checking, is really efficient for correcting single bit flips, but that'd be that. Okay, um, so over the past three years, I essentially went from block to block and looked at what needs to be done to secure storage integrity. Um, in the end, well, I got lots of nice check marks here. So all of this can actually be handled in software. We can secure registers, caches with simple ECC, simple erasure coding. Um, for volatile memory, so as ERAM, ERAM, etc., um, we can also use primitive information coding, but we have to apply memory scrubbing. So we have to continuously refresh the memory. Well, not just refresh it, but we have to read the memory, access the memory uh, to recompute the major coding on there and see if we got any new errors. So we have to prevent errors from 
accumulated. Uh, for non-volatile memory, well, we can actually efficiently use a combination of MRAM and an image encoding file system. And for, for highly scaled flash memory, well, there is entity mirror, which I just presented to you in the last slide. What's left then? Well, first of all, compute consistency. Because in the end, currently, at the moment, we're still left with those radiation tolerant processors, with Leo processor cores, which are nice, but are old. Um, and for example, NASA and ESA are by now aware that there will be no new development past the Leo 4 processor. That's the end of the line. There is nothing new coming here. Uh, processor design has become too complex for a small intellectual property development firm to maintain by themselves. Uh, Intel has been developing for I don't know how many decades on, on their instruction set. And not everyone has the resources in Intel. And Intel is also doing a lot of stuff that's not very efficient. And in space, we, in general, in critical systems, we have a lot of really, really, really difficult challenges that we have to handle, which we do not have on the Earth. So we have to reuse existing hardware, and we have to get that to work pro uh, properly everywhere, cheaply. And of course, there are satellite buses, which are unfortunately currently truly buses. So as in the bus architecture, like in networks. Uh, we've discontinued using buses in networks a long time ago, because well, we found out they're not all too reliable. Instead, we're using stars, double stars, rings, double rings, um, in space, that's not being used at the moment. There we really are using buses. We have to get away from that. <coughs> okay, brings us back to state of the, of the art for compute consistency. Well, there was some ongoing research on NARC's many cores and grid applications. Well, there is actually a lot that could be done there, but we actually introduced that for performance reasons in the IT, right? We wanted to do number crunching, we wanted to do massive parallelization. And we, can, we thought we could do this very efficiently with networks on the chip with many core systems. That's what, one, what the general idea would look like, right? And what we have here is, of course, a lot of inherent redundancy, which space engineering would really like. That's why they are supporting this kind of research. But in the end, there's, with this kind of research, there's always the issue of how to optimize your code to efficiently run there. How do you balance core distribution? How do you assure cache locality? How do you assure memory locality? That's unsolved topics. And the only way we can actually fix this, well, I don't know how we can fix it. I don't think that in IT we have developed a cure for this. Well, but what we can do, for example, is we can actually look at other things, like FPGAs. I got the idea of, hey, okay, actually, this looks a lot similar. So we have a lot of abstraction here, and and, and we can repurpose different knocks and different, uh, different many core, core components. Well, how about we use FPGAs? Because within an FPGA, we also have this extreme abstraction of blocks. We have programmable in interconnects. We have, we have logic blocks that we can almost freely configure to emulate any kind of system. Sure, performance is not so great, but in space, people don't need performance at the moment. People in space consider number crunching hardware that we've been using 15 years ago. Um, so, again, here there's well, sufficient performance, most certainly. And what we can do here is partial reconfiguration. We can partially reconfigure an FPGA. We can just do that. It's normal. That's what an FPGA is for, right? We can reconfigure an FPGA if, if, if some component failed in there, if some block failed in there, maybe due to a radiation effect. We can reconfigure that and repurpose it with a different layout, with a different Legrade layout. It still fulfills the same purpose. That can only be done, but it hasn't been done yet. Until two years ago, the space industry simply refused to use FPGAs because they were reconfigurable. They were scared of that. We can actually do a lot with that. And part of the, the reasons why they didn't like FPGAs so much was well, they didn't know how to reliably store FPGA designs because they are big, so they are a couple of megabytes in size. Um, that's no issue for us in IT, right? We store terabytes of data, or hundreds of terabytes. Um, so I guess this can, in some way, be considered solved. We can also do a lot. Well, how about we just use an SSD there to store?
store um, an FPG inside. And Truer has enough storage capacity. And if we use slightly like, different duration coding, we like proposed a couple of slides back that this can also work very nicely in space. Compute performance, as I said, is not an issue in space. There, people are happy with 30 mega, uh, uh, with 30 MIPS. 30 MIPS is nothing. That's less than a 30 megahertz processor. Finally, there is one issue within FPGAs, and that's fault detection. Lots of people did fault detection isolation and recovery papers on FPGAs and said, they are awesome. Yes, and they are cool. But everyone just wrote, once we have detected there is a fault, we will do whatever. But unfortunately, no one ever cared to look into how to detect faults. And that's what I'm currently looking into. And that's it. Thank you very much.